quantum physio. Okay. Our instructor today is Dr. Hassan Rahman. I think he's a seasoned therapist. He lives in Ontario, Canada. He did his doctor of physical therapy from A.T. Steele University. He grew up in Bangladesh, did his BSc in physiotherapy. He has, he has done his certification in orthopedic manual therapy from various places. He's assistant professor for just in university in Bangladesh and is also a clinical lecturer for NOSM, University of Canada. Okay. I'm Dr. TJ Singh and I have Dr. Steve Ford with me. We are the co-founders of Gem Physio. You can go to the next slide. Okay. This is our introduction. We, are, we both are fellowship trained and orthopedic clinical specialists from APTA. And we started this program, this organization to bridge a gap between your basic education, uh, basic education to advanced level orthopedic education, which is offered in the US. Yeah. Move on to the next slide, please. And this is me, a little bit of introduction about me and move on to the next slide, please. Okay. And I have Dr. Steve with me. Both of us are orthopedic clinical specialists, a doctor of doctorate of physical therapy, and a fellowship in orthopedic manual physical therapy from AOMT. Okay. Keep going. Okay, we are starting a cohort two, and uh, I think our first lecture is next weekend. If you're interested in joining us, you can reach out to Dr. Dhrumi. Uh, I think we'll be sharing the information at the end of the lecture. Uh, yeah, can you move to the next slide? Okay, this is the topic of the lecture. I think a lot of information we're going to share today, I think is very, very new. Like, I mean, uh, most of the research is done in the last 10 years. So this is uh, one of the most outstanding lectures, I mean, which you're offering for free. So we can move on to the next slide, Dr. Hassan. Okay, I think over to you. I think this is a lot of information and just sit back and enjoy. I think this is absolute gold dust. I mean, I think you can't find better information than this on this topic. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, Singh, Dr. Steve, and the uh, GEM team for giving me this opportunity to conduct this lecture today. And thank you, everybody, for your time. For Sunday, you know, I know it's the weekend, but still you are here for learning. So that's why we are really grateful to you. <laughs> So today our topic is understanding lateral hip pain and regional interdependence. I think you can hear me well, huh? Can you can you hear me? Any problem yes. with the slides or sound? No, you we are good. I think we can hear you. Good, thank you. So our outline of discussion is uh, we we should know what is regional interdependence and understanding kinetic chain and movement impairment syndrome and we're going to discuss why you should think globally, not locally. Uh, it could be before we used to uh, treat, assess locally where the problem is, but we, we tend to forget other area, proximal and distal area. So we'll discuss how uh, other areas can, can translate problem to different areas, and that is called regional interdependence. So discuss about lateral hip pain differential diagnosis, and we will discuss briefly uh, how to uh, treat tendon problem like tendinopathy or tendinitis, whatever we say, you know, we're gonna discuss that, uh, some principles, how we should treat, how to handle uh, tendon problems and how to assess, how to treat. And there is a, there'll be a case report at the end and we'll take your question and question session, answer session will be at the end and probably have a quiz after, after our lecture. Uh, you can attend the quiz to see how much you uh, learn from this lecture. So at the beginning, I like to uh, discuss about regional interdependence model. Uh, so probably uh, some of you already know what is regional interdependence. So the textbook definition is uh, primary musculoskeletal symptoms may be directly, indirectly related to or influenced by impairments from other area. For example, you have uh, pain in the hip joint, hip area, but the, it can be something going on other remote area that can influence or directly impact uh, your symptoms. 
So that's called visual interdependence. So I'll give you some examples here. So that will be easy for you to understand. For example, patient may complain of lateral hip pain, but the pain is affected by dysfunction or impairment of at your pelvis or knee or ankle or more than one area at, at the same time. You can see this image here. If patient complain of hip pain, let's see if I can get my pen. If the patient complain of hip pain here, he may have other issues, for example, Maybe his foot is pronated. Knee could be valgus position. And he may have more pressure in this area due to this uh, knee valgus foot pronation. And that could be the primary problem. And that causing your hip pain. So if you do not treat the knee or the foot, if you only treat the hip area, it's going to make any huge change for the patient. He might feel good for a day or two, but the pain might come back. You know? So that's why we'll discuss a little bit more uh, like uh, this intricate relationship, why this is happening and how to assess. So another example is here. If patient have a problem like patellofemoral pain syndrome. So patient complain pain, pain here, but if you forgot to see patient uh, patient's hip abductor strength, if you uh, forget to see their foot, in a standing weight bearing position, how it behaves, whether it's a pronated foot or normal arch. Mm -hmm. And if you do not see uh, how st strong the quadriceps, quadriceps are, so in that case, you might miss many, many important points. So that's why you have to think globally, not locally, uh, when you treat and when you assess. So let's discuss some basic uh, anatomy, pathoanatomy. So before we, we go forward, we need to know, we have to learn about the our facial slings in our body. So we can see here, there are four important slings in our body, anterior sling, posterior sling, deep longitudinal sling, and the lateral sling. So the first one is the anterior sling. You can see how, how this uh, sling goes. It cross like this. The posterior slings goes like this way. And the deep longitudinal slings goes like this way and goes towards the peroneal muscle. And the last one is the lateral sling. Now, for uh, for this lecture, for this topic, our main concern would be mostly have to check the lateral sling and deep longitudinal sling because these two slings can affect our uh, hip pain or knee pain. So if, you, if I see like deep longitudinal sling, it it uh, consists of erector, erector muscle, multifidus. So your erector muscle, your multifidus, mm -hmm. and then you can see it goes uh, your deep extern external rotator hip, that is your piriformis, your IT band, and the peroneals. So is at any point, if you have any dysfunction, for example, your multifidus is weak, or your uh, ITB is tight, that can affect the whole sling, you know? So that's why you have to know, uh, how to assess, how to check, and how to treat this problem. You know, the lateral sling it consists of your gluteus medius minimus and your QL on the opposite side. So if you have any weakness in your gluteus medius, it can affect your whole uh, lateral sling. So that's why you need to know these facial slings and where the force force is transmitted from one side to another area. So here I, I discuss, uh, discuss more detail about the lateral sling. So lateral sling consists of your gluteus medius, your minimus, your TF, TFL, LUTBL band, or IT. So if, if you have any underdeveloped lateral sling, this is a very important slide. We should a uh, little bit uh, know more, more detail. I'm going to take, spend more time in this slide. So if you have any underdeveloped lateral sling, so what can happen? So it can create a cascade of effect. It can uh, disturb your forced transfer or kinetic transfer. It can cause poor pelvic control. It can cause inefficient gait. It can cause your lumbar instability. It can compromise your core strength. So there are a lot of things can happen if you have any weakness in your gluteus medius minimus. Okay. And common symptoms when patient have uh, this sling affected, they may have um, iliotibial band friction syndrome, 
they have patellofemoral pain syndrome. So you can see like patient is complaining pain in the knee, but we are talking about the lateral sling that consists of your gluteus muscle. So that means we have to think globally, uh, not locally. So before I move forward, let me uh, discuss a little bit some basic anatomy. Uh, probably you can see me, I'm gonna use a skeletal model. So this is our uh, pelvic girdle, you can see, it's our right uh, hip bone, the left hip bone. So this is called innuminate bone. So innuminate consists of three different uh, uh, fused components, your ilium, your uh, ischium, and your pubis. So these three uh, bones, when it consisted and fused together, it, it, it form your innuminate bone. So this is your right innuminate, this is your left innuminate, and this is your sacrum that makes your pelvic girdle. You can see this picture, your ilium, pubis, ischium, that fits together and makes your innuminate bone. So this is very basic anatomy, but uh, to know more detail, because we're going to go uh, more in-depth discussions before we go into the, know this, the basic things, because I'm going to tell about the innuminate, so you should know what, what innuminate means, okay? So there are few common SI joint related dysfunctions can happen. So since we discuss about the innuminate, so it will, it will be easy to understand. So your innuminate can go anteriorly rotated. Probably can see me. Can you see me? Well, yeah, we, they can Good. see you. Yep. You so maybe the innuminate like... can be anteriorly rotated. It can be posteriorly rotated. It could. It can go out flare. It can go in flare, or it could be up slip or down sleep. So these are the six common uh, dysfunctions can happen. Uh, so we need to know this basic thing. So for the lateral hip pain, we are more interested about the out flare. When this, your innuminate is out flare, it can put too much pressure on the lateral side of the hip. So if your innuminate is out flare, you have more pressure on the lateral side of the hip. If your innuminate is posteriorly rotated, then you also can have lateral hip pain. So these two are very common. What is out flare of the innuminate bone or posterior innuminate rotation. So these two, we're gonna discuss a little bit more uh, in next few lecture, uh, slides. Okay, so there's another basic thing. When your innuminate is rotated anteriorly or posteriorly, then your sacrum, it uh, behave differently. For example, if your innuminate is posteriorly rotated, this side of the sacrum will go forward or tilted forward. It's called sacral nutation. So when you have sacral nutation, your innuminate should posteriorly rotate it. Or when your innuminate is anteriorly rotated, then your sac uh, sacrum would be posteriorly tilted. It's called sacral counter nutation. So you can see this picture if I um, use my pen. You can see this is your innuminate bone. If it is posteriorly rotated, this side of the sacrum will be anteriorly tilted. That is called nutation. What is your, uh, when is your, uh, innuminate is anteriorly rotated, your, that side, that side of the sacrum will be posteriorly tilted. It's called counter nutation. So this too, uh, you can know more detail when if you join our uh, gym um, cohort uh, too, or we have individual modules like pelvis SI joint modules. If you want to know more details, you can join our uh, module uh, sessions, upcoming module sessions. Okay. Okay, there are a few important muscles you should know. First is your gluteus medius and minimus. You can see both muscles are attached with your greater trochanter. So if you have any problem with your muscle, any kind of calcification, partial tear, or any kind of anything going on in the muscle, it can affect your greater trochanter because it's directly inserted over your greater trochanter. Second thing is your uh, three different muscles, your TFL, tensor fascia lata, your upper fire of the gluteus maximus and vastus lateralis. If you see, it says here, the most superficial layer of the abductor synergy exerting its effect via the tensioning of the ITV. That means any kind of tension in the TFL, UGM feel that 
causing tension in the ITB band. So anything happened there, it translates the ten tension through your ITB band. That's why ITB is very common, get skate style. And you'll find that a lot of the most of the people who have lateral hip pain or any hip pathology, their ITB is tight and is thickened or tender to touch. So this is very basic you need to know. But the problem is, you know, what we used to do before, we used to uh, do a myofascial release, eye stem or hot pack. We do in the ITB band, but we don't we don't treat the root cause. You know what's the problem is. You know if, if you see patient have gluteus problem, gluteal muscle issue, or some alignment issue, we do not correct that problem. But if you are treating only the ITB, is not going to help the patient. Okay, this is kind of very busy slide. I try to make it kind of simplify uh, to you for you. So it's called femoral neck angle. So this is the femoral neck angle. The normal angle is 120 to 135. But if the angle gets higher, or more than 135, it's called coxa vulga. If the angle is less than 120, it's called coxa vera. So when the neck angle gets lower, less than 120, it can cause some higher compressive force at the getter trochanter. So that means you can see this picture. When the angle is 115, is not less than normal, it put too much pressure in this getter trochanter. And it can cause some lateral heat pain. And if you see the other structure, when a patient have coxa vera, uh, they may have more knee vulgus. <laughs> And when patients have knee vulgus or knock knees, it can cause some foot pronation. Or if you go other way around, if patients have foot pronation, knee vulgus, it can cause some more uh, compressive force in your lateral hip. So you can see this picture here. Patients have foot pronation, their tibia is internally rotated, knee goes to vulgus position, and obviously that is going to put more pressure in your lateral side of the hip. So you can see how is these are connected. Okay, so this is kind of more summarized what I discussed so far. So if patient have lateral hip pain, and why it can happen due to the overloading, compressing force of the greater trochanter of orbursa, or maybe the tensile load. It could be the compressive force or the tensile load of the of the tendon that can cause your lateral hip pain and it can be from your uh, pelvic dysfunction if you have any issue for example unilateral sacral flexion uh, posterior intermediate rotation we'll discuss more uh, this, uh, uh, this this issue so it can be from your pelvis or sacroiliac joint it can be from your movement impairment syndrome if your hip is adduction with with or without medial rotation due to the weak gluteus medius and tight your tightness of the ITB and TFL that can cause your lateral hip pain due to this compressive force and let and tensile load. Third could be if you have any coxa vera that is causing let uh, decrease uh, femoral neck angle uh, that can uh, cause some cascade of effect. For example, knee can be vulgus position, tibia can be internally rotated, could, foot could be pronated. So this could be your third things that can cause lateral hip pain. And the fourth is, if you have any dysfunction, if your lateral sling, for example, if you have any weakness of the gluteus medius, minimus, tensor fascia lata, or if you have any problem with your deep longitudinal sling. So anything can cause lateral hip pain. So you can see, uh, it's, it, it's, it sounds easy, but uh, if when you kind of, kind of deep dig, you know, you find it's not that easy. You have to think so many uh, issues here, think globally. And have to your assessment should be more detailed and have to address all these things. Okay, let's go with your our uh, basic topic: gluteal tendinopathy or getter trochanteric pain syndrome. So this is an umbrella term. This is not a diagnosis. Under this umbrella, it could be you might have uh, tendinopathy, gluteal tendinopathy, or gluteal tendon tear, partial tear. You have you may have bursitis, and we can say this as a beta trochanteric pain syndrome. So they said it's not a diagnosis, but it is a 
umbrella term. Okay, so when patient have this GTPS or greater trochanteric pain syndrome, they usually complain pain at night. Most of the time they say, okay, if I lay on my side, I cannot lay more than half an hour. Or even if they lay on their good side, the problem is their kind of painful side is a deducted position and that is putting too much tensile load or compressive force on the in the hip area. So it doesn't matter which side they lay down, they feel pain. And walking, running, I feel, especially I feel walking, going up stairs is more painful, uh, especially when you're loading like uh, on your painful side. When you're, for example, if you have pain on the right side, if you stand on your right side, on your right stance on the uh, right side, going up and down, you feel pain. Uh, pain may develop during prolonged sitting. Sometimes it could be uh, office worker, they're sitting on a, not a proper ergonomic chair, and that putting too much load in there, especially if they sit on a low chair or low sofa, then it put more pressure you know, on their lateral side of the hip. So here um, you can see this picture I, I, I took from Dr. Alison uh, Grimaldi. She did a lot of work on lateral hip pain and also other hip issues. Uh, she's one of the pioneer uh, Australian physio. Um, and a few of the slides and information I took from her course I took a few months ago. So for the GTPS, uh, usually the pain should be on the lateral side. It can refer down on the ITV, along the ITV area. Usually this pain should not go beyond your knee. But if the pain patient complain pain in your uh, kind of your groin area, especially if I show you, uh, it's like a C-shaped area, like here. Probably can see me, huh? I'm going to see my video. Okay, so you can see. With the patient complaint pain here, this is a C, uh, it's called C-shaped pain. So that could be probably from your hip pathology. It could be your labral, labral pathology or hip joint problem. But if you find the pain is coming uh, from lower back and travel down all the way down to the to the foot, then you have to think about the lumbar spine. So pain area is important, uh, and that can give you or guide you which area you should uh, address first. Okay. So if you have any question, you can uh, send in the chat box. We're going to discuss all of your questions uh, when we finish our lecture. Okay, this is a very important slide. Uh, so Dr. Grimaldi, uh, he, he, she mentioned in her uh, article and also in her blog, the gluteus medius and minimus tendon pathology is almost always present. When patients have trochanteric pain, you can see almost 88 to 98% case, gluteus tendon pathology is always present. So if, if somebody uh, diagnosed uh, the patient has a bursitis, you can, you can be sure that 88% at least, there should be some tendon pathology or gluteus muscle pathology there. Uh, 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 Dr. Hassan, I think, can you hide, can you close the hide bar, menu bar? Because I think that is just kind of hiding oh, okay. the slide. But yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to make it yeah. shorter. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay now, huh? Uh oh yeah it's good it's better you can just move this out of the way actually yeah. better yeah okay thank you okay so the thing second thing this is also important ITB thickening uh so we'll find a lot of most of the patients when you have patient have lateral hip pain their ITB is tight tender and you'll see there is some thickening in the ITB tendon so it says ITB thickening may occur around thirty percent of the people so obviously you know. This is very common, ITB thickening, and also uh, gluteus, uh, gluteal tendon pathology should be present most of the time when patients have trochanteric pain. Okay, so this is uh, another slide, compressing force. Let me hide the bar, otherwise it might, you know, just a second, I'm gonna hide my... Is it better now, huh? Yeah, yeah, this is good. Okay, good. Okay, so this is also another important slide. Uh, like 
when you were standing, like single leg stands, you can see the right side. When you're standing, when you, when you are zero degree uh, angle, it put only four Newton pressure or compressive force. When this angle becomes 10 degree, you have 36 Newton force pressure here. When it is 40 degree, you can see it's almost 106 uh, Newton pressure exerted on the lateral side of the hip. So that's why uh, when patient have lateral hip pain, we recommend not to stand single leg too long or don't hang, you know, like standing, hanging your body okay, on one side, but that can put a lot of compressive force there and that can cause uh, more pain. Okay? okay. So this is another kind of busy slide. So I'm trying to make it uh, simple for you. So what it says here, um, when you stand single leg, so if I show you here, <clears throat> When I'm standing, for example, my right side, uh, there should be some hip at adductor and abductor. There should be some muscle balance there. Okay. If, if in case if your abductor is weak, it can cause more adduction movement, movement and put more pressure on the lateral side of the hip. That's why when you when you're walking, when you're taking your steps, when your stance on on the painful side, every time you Put step or going upstairs, you are putting too much load on the lateral side of the hip, because as I said, it's due to the weakness of your gluteus medius and minimus, and that can lead to uh, it's called Tendinitis gait. So I'll, I'll discuss in my next slide. So there are main two main strategies can happen when patient have gluteal tendinopathy. One is called uncompensated Tendinitis You can see when patient have uh, pathology on this side and this muscle is weak, their pelvis drops. This is called uncompensated because body drops this side. Okay? Sometimes patient, uh, they try to lean their body towards the painful side to correct the shift. So that's called compensated terendolin birth. So both can happen if patient have a uh, long-term chronic uh, gluteal tendinopathy. Sleeping position is very important when patient, they lay on their side. For example, if they have uh, pathology on this side, when they lay down, they don't, if they don't put anything in between their both knees, it put a more compressive force and uh, there is a more tensile load in the tendon. So if you put it, that's why when, when I see patient, I, 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 I advise them to put a pillow in between their both knees when they sleep. Also, a few important things. Uh, we should not. Um, we should advise them not to sit leg crossed. So it happened actually. I, I was I was talking with Doctor Singh uh, that I had a patient uh, maybe a month ago. So when I saw the referral from the doctor, the referral says uh, gluteal bursitis, uh, tetrochanteric bursitis, and I saw the patient sitting there waiting for me, leg crossed. You know, so I did not say anything to to her. I took her in, did my assessment. When I was discussing about this, um, like ergonomic thing, activity modification, and when I, when I told that, uh, okay, should not sit leg crossed. And she said, oh my God, I have been doing this for the last few years, you know. And she herself corrected that problem. And also I, I mentioned about that, don't sit on a low chair because when, you're, when your knee, hip is below your knee, you're putting too much load on, on your hip area. That's why uh, Dr. Gimaldi mentioned in one of the slide. I'm going to mention how to sit in proper way when you have hip pain. That's why activity modification is very important because when you treat a patient, you are doing your manual therapy, you are doing uh, modalities, patient feeling good for half an hour, one hour, or a day. But if they don't change their lifestyle, still they are doing this wrong thing, leg crossed, sitting low chair. Uh, then what happened is that treatment isn't going to affect or it will not give a long lasting result. Okay, so how this pain can start? Every time I see a patient with a lateral hip pain, uh, I find something is going wrong like in their life. Probably they start something new they, they are not used to. For example, they take a new sport or new exercise they started with their friends or going for hiking 
and the weekend probably they're going for afil walking or you know so anything they do they're not used to do so that can put too much load compressive force tensile load in the lateral hip and that can cause problem you know for the uh, for the female uh, pregnancy or due to the hormonal change the muscle could be more relaxed and then, then that can also can cause uh, lateral hip pain So next, uh, we're going to go uh, to the examination sections. Uh, if you have any difficulty in understanding anything, you can let me know. I can uh, review again. Or else we're going to go to the next uh, next slides, OK? So any kind of hip pathology, knee pathology, we start with, I start with the lumbar spine, just to rule out the lumbar spine. Just a quick test, flexion, extension, quadrant test to see anything any uh, kind of movement causing any symptoms or their familiar symptoms, especially. So for example, if patient have pain with flexion, so then we're gonna go a little bit further. We do some repeated movement, for example, repeated extension or patient have problem with extension, feel pain on the extension. We do repeated, repeated flexion to see whether it, it makes any change in their symptoms, whether it is causing satellization or peripheralization. So that's gonna guide you whether we should start with the lumbar spine or not. So this is the basic test, basic test flexion extension and quadrant test. Then we're gonna start um, examining the hip joint. So hip joint, we start with the active range of motion, passive range of motion. Uh, can you, uh, can you uh, say, let me know, uh, what is the capsular pattern for the hip joint? You can uh, write down in the chat box. For the hip joint, what could be the capsular pattern? Like which movements uh, usually get restricted when patient have capsular pattern? I cannot see my uh, chat box, so probably Dr. Singh, you can. Yeah, I think I'm still we're still waiting for the response. I mean, so okay. guys, capsular pattern of the hip. Come on, this is not this is basic stuff. Getting some responses, but I think we yet to get a correct response. But to see, I'm not sure whether we we uh, put the recording recording on or not. You were recording it, yes, doctor. Um, we are recording. Doctor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, for the capsular pattern, usually flexion is restricted, abduction is restricted, and internal rotation is restricted. So internal internal rotation, most of the time, internal rotation is the main uh, that can give you some idea. Patient might have some uh, hip joint path, uh, problem, you know. So to rule out hip osteoarthritis, we can do some special tests like scour test, favor test. Though they are not very reliable, you have to do a cluster of tests. You have to see patient's lifestyle, what uh, position they feel pain, how long the stiffness lasts, you know, and also have to check patient's active and passive movement. Then you can reach a diagnosis for the patient have hip osteoarthritis. But those tests are okay, but you have to uh, combine all these tests, cluster of tests, and then, it, then, then you can interpret. We have to also rule out uh, either any hip, hip impingement, especially we do flexion, reduction, internal rotation, it's just test for impingement to femoral acetabular impingement present or not. So these are very basic tests we should do. And then we have to check our um, SI joint, uh, some basic, uh, we start with the really supine to sit test. So supine test, um, if patient have, as I mentioned before, uh, if patient have, if the illuminate is posteriorly rotated, so what we can expect, like when this is, Posteriorly rotated, it's only in supine line, you'll find this leg is short. Okay. So this is post illuminate bone on the right side. If it is posteriorly rotated, this leg should be short. So supine line, you will find this leg is short. When you patient, when you sit the patient up, you will find this leg become uh, either neutral or become uh, short. So it's called 
uh, long to short. Sorry. Sorry, sir. When the, this is posted rotated, this is short. And when patient does sit up, it becomes neutral or become long. It's called short to long. That indicate that this illuminate is posteriorly rotated. So as, as I mentioned that when patient have lateral hip pain, sometimes you find that patient, their illuminate bone is posteriorly rotated. And you'll find supine line, this leg is short. When they sit up, you'll find this become neutral or become long. So that one thing you should check uh, to see whether anything going on in the pelvic area. We also do the seated flexion test to see uh, it's one side is hypomobile or not. So you, you'll know more detail of uh, all this test when you join our um, SI joint and pelvic module um, session in upcoming sessions. Um, I'm not gonna go very detail. And also we do some palpation, especially um, we look for is any kind of um, kind of um, prominent, uh, prominent or depression in the sacral sulcus, especially uh, this is called sacral sulcus. Usually, you palpate here. I'm going to co compare right and left to, to see in one side is uh, more <clears throat> depressed than other. We also check the isla or inferior, inferior lateral angle to see whether it is the same uh, level or one is up or more prominent. So these things are going to give you some idea of whether your sacrum is anteriorly, anteriorly tilted or posteriorly tilted. Uh, that will give you some idea. But I'm not going to go detail because uh, it will not uh, the, the time will not permit to do all these things. So now, there's some special test for your lateral hip pain. The first test usually we do single leg stance. So you can see here, um, and the, the actual test it's, it's it's it says to stand in single leg for thirty seconds. But they mentioned that if the patient start feeling pain, you don't have to stay thirty seconds. You can stop the test if the patient feels already feel pain on the lateral side of the hip. Patient will place one finger uh, against the wall, just only one finger to maintain the balance, but not the whole hand, not full support, okay? And patient is not allowed to do lateral deviation of the trunk, ipsilateral side. So can anybody tell me uh, lateral deviation of trunk to ipsilateral side is it a uh, compensated turn bark or uncompensated? If I go to my previous lecture, previous slide. If patient is tilted towards the same side, for example, single leg standing, if, if patient they have leaned towards the ipsilateral side, it's called compensated turn bark sign. Okay. So we are not, patient is not allowed to do that when we do the test. Patient will be standing single leg with one finger support against the wall and they, they are not allowed to do no lateral deviation. So if the pain comes before 30 seconds, then the test is positive. It's called single leg stance test. We do for the lateral hip pain. This is the first test. Second test is palpation. And palpation is very reliable at test. Uh, we'll discuss more. Um, we're going to palpate where the glucator trochanter is to see any local pain on palpation. Next test is ad adduction resisted test. So, patient uh, leg will be dropped uh, to adducted position. I will ask the patient to lift their leg up and we're going to resist here to see if it produces any pain in, in the lateral hip. It's called ADDR test. The next test is um, FADER resistance test, flexion, adduction, external rotation. So patient leg will be flexed, adducted, and externally rotated. Now in this position, I'll ask the patient to do internal rotation. That means turning the foot outward. Now I'm going to resist here. I'm going to put resist here and to see if it produces any pain in the lateral hip. So this is another test we, uh, we have to do. Okay, now let's explain this uh, all three tests. So when you attend the quiz, you will find this um, this test. We have few questions about this test. So uh, just uh, kind of give your attention, please. The first one is single leg standing. It says it's the highest specificity. That means it's a very reliable test. 
So standing for 30 seconds or less if the pain is already started. Second is your palpation. Palpation, it says the highest sensitive, sensitive test. So this one is highest specificity and palpation is the highest sensitivity. That means they both are very, very reliable tests. Then you can also include your uh, FADER resistive test. Uh, and then you can also add your ADR. ADDR tests. So these two also you can include in your in your examination. So when you combine all these tests, then you can get a reliable result. Oh, and also I'm going to mention here, some people have to doesn't have any data trochanteric pain or uh, lateral hip pain, but if you send for MRI, you'll find 30% people have MRI is positive, but you'll find the test is negative. There is no pain, so MRI is not a reliable test. So it says MRI results should never be used in isolation in diagnosis of symptoms of catatrochanteric pain. So let's go for the treatment. So initially, when patients have acute stays, a lot of pain, we ask them to take active rest, not complete bed rest. Patient can still walk, still uh, they can do what uh, they like to do, but Activity modification is, is very important. We'll discuss a little bit more. Uh, so active breast, you're going to start with. If there's inflammation, then probably the doctor, they can prescribe anti-inflammatory. Uh, and then we can uh, think about ice therapy and heat therapy. Usually I find when patients have inflammation, ice works better than the heat, especially the beta trochanteric area. Uh, if you want to use some electrotherapeutic modalities, though is not uh, some are not evidence based, but if patient feels good, then why not? You know, but as I said, it's not gonna address your root cause. It can give some uh, some relief. You can use K tape. Some study shows K tape. It helps a little bit. Uh, you can use maybe other maybe ultrasound if you want to. But as I said, it's not there's not not evidence based. Uh, another thing I find really helpful to unload the area. So for example, if you have any pain on the right hip, I, I advise them to use the a cane on the left hand when they walk. So that's going to unload the, the hip and prevent any kind of tendon gait and also uh, kind of keep the pelvis in neutral position. So then not develop any other pain in remote area, for example, lower back, you know. So unloading is, uh, is, is sometimes really helpful. The cane can unload the, the painful area for short term. Now, if you find any um, problem with the pelvis, the alignment of the pelvis, then we can do some muscle energy techniques. Uh, I'm not going to discuss very detailed, but just know the basic uh, mechanism, how it works. So I mentioned that when patients have lateral hip pain, there are two dysfunction is very common. One is uh, posterior inuminate rotation or out flare of the inuminate bone. So one is posterior inuminate rotation or out flare. So here, uh, in this muscle energy techniques, we can correct this uh, posterior inuminate rotation. So what we are trying to do, when this, this inuminate bone is posteriorly rotated, if we can activate the hip flexor, then what happens? This rotation can get corrected because we are using the hip flexor to correct this uh, rotation. We're going to rotate anteriorly by, using the, by, by contracting the hip flexor muscle. So that can work really good. The patient will be laying supine, their kind of dysfunctional side should be down, the leg should be down. Therapist put gentle pressure down here. With other hand, they're going to stabilize opposite PSIS. We'll, we'll ask the patient to lift their right leg up. Very minimal gentle pressure. They're going to hold there for six seconds. And as I said, it's not, it's not kind of... Um, is not kind of uh, too much load, only very minimal tension so that we don't want to engage other muscles. So six second hold, you can repeat three to four times. Then you can check the leg length to see whether it, it, it any correction happen or not. So that is called muscle energy techniques for the posterior inuminate rotation. Okay, we can do also manipulation. Uh, as I said, if you want to learn all these techniques, you can join our gym uh, cohort too. In upcoming uh, class, I think from December, we're gonna take another batch. So for SI joint manipulation, patient will be laying on, on, on their side. Their painful side should be up. So this is the painful side. So therapist, uh, what he's doing, uh, he's taking up the slug, uh, the 
he's holding this hand and he's he is using his hand over the PSIS and then give it quick thrust. So that's gonna correct the because the pelvis is kind of more posterior rotated. But if you can thrust from here from the PSIS, you can correct the posterior animated rotation. Okay, next we're gonna discuss about the then then you know Bethy, how to treat. So this slide uh, I took uh, from Learn Physio. So Jill Cook, uh, she's kind of, I, sh I should say, probably you all know about Jill Cook. He, he's the pioneer of treating tendinopathy. She advised these 10 things when you treat any tendon problem. So they said, don't rest completely. Patient should not be complete rest, you know, because it isn't gonna help with the tendon. Prescribe appropriate exercise. So what we are discussing here. And they said, don't rely on passive treatments. Like, Precipitment means like uh, something physio are doing for patient. Like for example, if you are doing myofascial release, or if you are doing uh, deep friction massage, or if you are doing ultrasound, you know, or any modalities, these are all considered as a passive treatment. So they said, don't rely on. You can apply, but don't rely on passive treatments because that those can give a short term relief, not a long lasting result. And this she said, don't use the injection because uh, that can change your tendon tendon structure. And it can cause some recurrence if you if you repeatedly inject the tendon, this uh, tendon tendinopathy can come back again. And she said, don't ignore the tendon pain. So, for example, if you prescribe exercise and patient the next day, uh, patient have a lot of pain. So that means you are actually overloading the tendon. So that's that's why she mentioned that if you prescribe any exercise, see how 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 you feel next day. 24 hours or next day morning, if you see the patient pain is not bad, still the same. Uh, that means probably you're doing the correct thing. But if you find the pain is more than like five, six, seven out of 10, then have to modify your, your treatment, treatment plan. Don't stress the tendon. So that is very important because uh, this ITB pain or this lateral hip pain, even like two years ago, I used to kind of advise patient to do some ITB stretch, you know, from stretch, but those are not uh, indicated because that can the stretching can cause more tensile load or compressive force in the hip area. That's why stretching is not the best treatment for the tendon. It's not only for the lateral hip; it could be any tendon. And also, she advised not to do transverse friction massage. Imaging is not uh, indicated. Don't be worried about rupture. If you have any partial tear. Uh, don't worry about that. Keep doing your exercise uh, and also just monitor and progressively loading the tendon. And they said, don't rush rehab. You should you should be uh, patients because the, the, it's only the protocol is eight to 12 weeks. I think probably Dr. Singh will, will be able to tell better. It's only this, for the tendon rehab, it's only we, we go like eight to 12 weeks, you know? That's why we, we say the patient, if you don't see any not, noticeable change within one or two weeks, uh, don't stop your, your program, keep doing. Uh, you will see the change, you know. I think this is a gradual process. I mean, yeah, you need to take time. I mean, because patients will be extremely sensitive. If you've seen chronic hip pain, like chronic lateral hip pain, I think the patients will be very sensitive. And uh, yeah, you just have to go slow. The tendons heal very slowly. So one of the reasons, I mean, the the vascular the vascularity of tendon is not great. So they heal very slowly. So you have to go slow. Gradual loading, progressive loading. I think we, we sometimes talk about the exercise prescription being between 100 to 200 repetitions a day somewhere. And then you just go like 10% of one RM and just go slow and, and try to progress it. Add eccentric exercises when you feel like the sensitivity has gone down. And then, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Okay, so... For the tendon uh, group greater trochanteric pain, we're gonna follow the leap trial protocol. Uh, that is kind of, I should say, uh, more effective compared to other protocols. So you can see here, uh, we start with the isometrics. Patient will be supine lying, and she will be or she will be using a belt or the elastic band. It's gonna try to do abduction and asymmetric abduction, and patient can hold for maybe 30 seconds or less at the beginning. And you can, you can do five repetitions and you can progress to 45 seconds if they can hold that long. So it's kind of more um, isometrics hold 
long time, longer, like 30 seconds to 45, uh, 45 seconds. So 30 seconds to 45 seconds. You can do five repetitions twice a day. Then we can do bridging. I'm going to show you the video so that it'll be easy for you to understand. The bridging, the progression is offset bridge, the single leg, single leg bridge. So after that, when the patient can tolerate load, then you can start loading in the functional position, squatting, offset squat, then single leg stands, then single leg squat. Then we're going to do step up exercise. Then after that, you can, we're going to introduce uh, kind of strengthening with the band. We can do also eccentric exercises. That will be kind of when the patient pain level is kind of minimal. Then we can include the isotonic in our exercise program. So we start with isometrics, and then we progress to isotonic, and then we can start doing functional loading. So isometric exercise has some benefit. Study shows that isometric exercise can stimulate descending pain inhibitory pathways. So, so that's going to um, uh, suppress your pain sensation. So asymmetric exercise, when you're holding longer, like 30 seconds to 45 seconds, a couple of times, that stimulate your descending pain path, inhibitory pathway and suppress the pain. Patient will feel less pain. So this uh, principle is not only for the gluteal tendon pain. It could be any tendon in your body, like it could be supraspinous tendon. It could be any other tendon. We also uh, do sustain this and how much force you can apply. Say so sustain low intensity contraction, like 25% of the maximum voluntary isometric contraction. If you can, if you can do 100%, you're going to use only 25% of your maximum asymmetric contraction. And it says when you use 25% maximum voluntary asymmetric contraction, they are most effective to raising your pain pressure threshold. So that means you it's going to subside your pain. Be able to do more okay so this is important 25 percent so that might be in your quiz so uh remember this uh percentage 25 percent maximum voluntary asymmetric contraction also uh it has some mechanical effect when you load the tendon it kind of increases your ability to adapt you know because when you loading the tendon there's some adaptability in the tendons so that it can take more load and with less pain So this slide is a very interesting and nice slide I take from running physio. He, he's also based on Australia. So he, he advised to do a start, start isometrics. For example, the patient pain is on only one side, for example, on the right side. So he mentioned, okay, you can use a pillow in uh, under the leg. Ask the patient to abduct the leg as far as comfortable. If highly irritable, this might mean simply lifting some of the weight of the leg off the pillow. Like we have to go all the way up, just slightly off the pillow, so that the muscle get uh, contracted and isometric contraction. You're going to use a pillow so that when patient land, they will not go all the way down to a reduction position. That's why you have to use multiple pillows. And uh, he mentioned, uh, I often start with short isometric hold for, of 5 to 10 seconds then four to five repetitions, then progress by increasing hold time towards a maximum of 40 seconds. So he advised you can go up to 40, 40, 40 seconds, maybe five repetitions. Then we can increase resistance or replace with a more dynamic exercise. More dynamic means more weight bearing, load bearing and functional position, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna show you some videos uh, how to progress your bridge exercise. So it's kind of normal breeze, what we usually do. And then if, we, if the patient can tolerate, we can do what's called offset breeze. And when they can do offset breeze without any pain, then we can go, go kind of more challenging one, single leg. Every time you have to think about the pelvis, so that the pelvis uh, is in a correct alignment, patient should not drop their pelvis. It should be level. So this is our breeze progression. Let me show you how to do an 
functional loading progression. So first you're going to do this normal squat. And if the patient can do without pain, then you can do a uh, Is the progression. They can do single leg stance. If they can tolerate without pain, then they can do single leg squat. And after maybe a day or two or a few days, if, if you find this is pain free, then you can start doing step step up. The purpose is to gradually load the tendons. This is such a great information, Dr. Rahman. This is such an awesome information. Thank you. <laughs> and also we do dry needling, uh, electroacupuncture. I, I do a lot um, and I prefer to do because it's my, my choice because I find it really helpful. Sometimes the evidence sometimes is not maybe support strongly for the electroacupuncture or dry needling, but I find it really helpful. So first I think, okay, which muscles are overactive or, or tight and which muscles are weak? So for example, if you think overactive muscle, it will be, uh, okay, can you tell me like in the chat box, which, mu which muscles or structure will be overactive or tight? And which muscles will be inhibited or weak? For the lateral hip pain. You can use the chat box to the first thing I, I, I cannot see the chat box. You can I think people it. are people are saying TFL. So yeah, TFL, ITV, these are a bit tight. And inhibited muscle will be gluteus, medius, minimus, maximus, this muscle. So when I do a, a dry ling, usually I target this TFL and ITV, and it works really good. And when I do electroacupuncture, usually I use uh, motor points for the gluteus, medius, minimus, and maximus. I use the electric stimulation, and it works really good because if you can uh, reactivate the muscle, if you can wake up the muscle, and if you can uh, kind of uh, uh, release the tension from your TFL and the ITV, I find it, it works really good when you combine with other treatment options. Mm. Okay. So this uh, slide from the uh, from the Dr. Gimaldi's uh, blog, and uh, she mentioned no no stretching ITV like what we have been doing for many years, many many years. Like a uh, few few months ago, I had a patient like uh, she has came with the, as I said like I, I every day I almost treat one patient with lateral hip pain and it's very common for the female population. And she said, you know, I have she said she had pain on both sides, and she said I, I asked her what exercise you have been doing. She said, I, I have been doing ITV stretch. I've been doing piriform stretching, clamshell, you know, many years, you know. And I said, you know, you shouldn't be doing when the pain is that bad. You should stop doing all this. Um, just modify your daily daily life, um, sitting posture, laying posture. And I start loading the tendon. And she find that even like the changing her daily life, her pain is almost 40% 40, 40 gone, you know. So that's kind of, I think, amazing. Because if you're doing wrong exercise, wrong position, and it is not going to help you at all at all. So no ITB stretch when patients have a lot of pain, especially the lateral hip area. And she also mentioned Dr. Gimaldi uh, in her blog, if you have lateral hip pain, no clamshell. And she said, ban the clamp. It's very interesting. She said, ban the clamp, you know. So, so no clamshell, no uh, piriformis or gluteal stretch, no ITB stretch. And for the female population, if they carry baby in one side, that means they are putting too much load in one side, that can be causing more compressive force, especially for the female after pregnancy or during pregnancy to the hormonal release. Uh, there could be some laxity in the tendon and they carry baby on one side, they may develop the tendon pain. Yeah. Okay, so this is another slide, same thing what I, I mentioned, uh, no, no, it's not standing a single leg too long. No sitting with leg crossed, no ITB stretch. Uh, so these are this should be avoided. Okay, so sleeping posture. So usually I recommend if, if uh, I ask the patient what's your preferable laying position. Do you are you a side sleeper or do you lay on your back? 
if they say, okay, I, I like to sleep on my side, then I, I ask them to put a pillow in between both knees. If they like to lay on their back, then pillow under both knees would be, uh, it, would, it would put no compressive force in the hip area, you know. And when they lay on their side, they should not, well, another important thing, like they should not bend their knee more than 90. If they, if they lay like this, that put too much pressure here. So this is the proper way. You can see this is less than 90, okay? This is 90. It should be below 90. So you can see this is uh, probably close to 90. This is below 90. So this is the better position. And this, this is not. And also, uh, she gave some walking tips. She said, like, uh, when you walk, take short stride. Because there are another problem can happen in um, in the in the in this area, especially uh, if I show you here in this model. <clears throat> so lateral hip pain, patient complain pain here, but some people pain develop pain in this area. It's kind of in between your your uh, scale, uh, your femur and ischial tuberosity. Uh, Kind of more down here. It's called ischiofemoral impingement. So there's a test we do for the ischiofemoral impingement. We ask them to walk with long stride. If they complain pain there, and then the other test is positive, then we can diagnose the ischiofemoral impingement. So for any lateral hip pain or ischiofemoral impingement, we we advise them to take short steps or sh short, um, sh short stride, so that it put not too much load in the in the lateral side of the hip. Okay, sleeping, uh, sorry, sitting position, posture is very important. Um, if you can see here, uh, when the patient sits, if, if their knee is below their hip, this is a better position. So this is the knee as the hip uh, kind of plane. So you can see the knee is uh, kind of below you, the hip area. Sometimes they use a waist pillow, waist pillow, waist cushion, that might be helpful. Or as even if you ask them to uh, put a maybe a towel, put a towel under their hip, so that hip should be slightly higher than their knee. That helps with the, any kind of hip pathology, like hip arthritis. Even arthritic patient can get, get help from this sitting in this position. And any kind of impeachment, labral problem, glorial tendinopathy, this can help. Uh, that means patient will not sit a low chair or so far, you know, watching a movie for hours that can increase their pain. You know? Okay, so what can be other thing? Other things can happen other than this uh, gluteal lateral hip pain, you know, because there are other structures are there. So we need to um, be mindful about these things. That thing also can happen, especially patient have numbness uh, in this area, the total ITB area. That could be from the lateral, it's called lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, pathology. Any kind of um, nerve compression can cause the tingling numbness in the lateral side of the hip. The pain can come from your lumbar spine. That's why you have to rule out your lumbar spine. You have to rule out any, any arthritis in the hip. You should be asked about what makes the pain worse. You want to check active movement, passive movement. You have to do some special tests, and then you can come in conclusion whether that patient have any osteoarthritis. It can happen, patient have luteal tendinopathy at the same time may, may, may have hip osteoarthritis. And then you have to modify your treatment too. Patient also can have uh, tendon tear. Luteal tendon partial thickness tear is very common. There's an article it, it says that um, even, even if you have partial tear, uh, the treatment, we don't need to modify. Just keep doing the gradual loading because um, after two, three years, if you go for surgery, without surgery, outcome is the same. You have to think about the scale femoral impingement I mentioned. This is your uh, scale tuberosity. Uh, this is your femur. If the patient complain pain here, if I show you, uh, the hip pain is only uh, will complain pain the side of their hip. But the pain complains here. And when they walk long stride, like taking long steps, if the pain feels in this area, then should suspect patient might have ischial femoral impingement. There's another thing like vascular claudication. With the vascular claudication, patient may have groin, groin pain, lateral hip pain, and the pain is usually doesn't relate to your position change or your movement. Like, um, for example, if you have any pain in the lateral hip, for example, if you're walking and suddenly start feeling pain, 
If you stop walking, the pain should go away immediately. It does not kind of doesn't matter which position you sit or lay down. Uh, recent study also shows psychological factors can influence. This says pain catastrophizing self efficacy and depression can also increase your pain severity. So if it is a chronic pain pro problem, you also have to uh, modify your treatment, uh, to pain education, uh, other things you should consider uh, adding in your treatment plan. Now let's go with a case report. Uh, Dr. Singh, do you want to uh, discuss the case? I can discuss the case report. Yeah, thank you. So the idea is that we are trying to reduce the activity in TFL. I think there's a question on the chat box. I'm trying to respond to that. Uh, so TFL is hypertonic. You can either do needling or work on that. We always focus on working on the prime mover which is gluteus medius, sometimes posterior gluteus medius. And if you work on the prime mover, you tend to actually inhibit TFL. Another very cool trick to inhibit TFL is manipulate L4, L5. Temporarily, it will shut down TFL. And I think there have been studies done where you manipulate L4, L5. Patient may not have L4, L5 dysfunction, but when you're treating them, you want to promote gluteus medius activity, you want to shut down TFL during the treatment, you can manipulate L4, L5, and then that will shut down TFL for a few minutes. And that will actually help you with the rehab. Okay. So we're talking about the case report. And I think most of us, if you have been practicing for a while, we have seen, seen this kind of patient presentation. So your patient is a 50 year old female with right-sided hip and pelvic pain, which aggravates with lying on the right side and walking uphill, okay? The supine to sit is short to long on right, okay? Patient has pain with single leg standing. I think Dr. Heman was talking about that this is a very sensitive test, okay? Palpation on tenderness on the right, greater trochanter, and gluteus medius, and some thickening of ITB, I think which comes from Garibaldi's literature. Uh, positive for there, and adduction resistance test. Posterior gluteus medius strength is three negative. We do talk about how to selectively test posterior gluteus medius in our program, because I think that is important. It is not your conventional test. Sciatic negative nerve sign is negative to rule out, to rule out any lumbar pathology, no, no foot arching issue. It is not because of pes planus. Anybody can tell me the diagnosis, what, why, what would you do? You can move on to the next slide. Okay, so these are the important findings. I think Dr. Rahman has been very, very meticulous how he has marked the important findings. So Uh, what is the compression and depression of SSG? I think we can uh, we can do those tests, but those tests don't tell you what kind of you want to say compression and distraction. So I mean, those tests don't tell you. I mean, I think yeah. Anybody can tell me what the diagnosis here is. Posterior nominate is correct. I mean, somebody's texting me in a personal message, but posterior nominate is fine. But I think what Unilateral sacral like flexion dysfunction, posterior nominate rotation is good. That's correct. And unilateral sacral like flexion is correct. And that is a very common patient presentation you will see. You can definitely find like gluteus tendinopathy because we have sensitive tests. That's another diagnosis apart from the dysfunctional diagnosis. Okay. Yeah, you have SI dysfunction, but I mean, it ha sometimes you have to be specific in how you're treating. Okay, posterior normal rotation, okay. okay. So right sacral base is deep, which means the sacrum on that side is sitting in mutation or flexion. So pine to set is short to long, we call it posterior normal rotation. Enough sensitive, tens sensitive and specific tests there, we can rule in gluteal tendinopathy. We, we can see that posterior gluteus media strength is reduced. Can LNLP present with GTPS? It can be, but usually you have like a posterior chain problems that cause or lateral chain problems that 
LNL, LNL is usually a symmetrical torsion. We're discussing this because you're in the program. So usually you'll have like anterior nominate. Anterior, nom anterior chain problems usually don't give you lateral hip pain. It can, but not usually. Lying on the right side is giving compression force and acetabulum compression. So I want to know. So lying on the right side is giving compression force on the, along with the acetabulum. So I want to know. So the problem with gluteal tendinopathy is if I have right gluteal tendinopathy, right trochanteric bursitis, I cannot lay on the right side, side because I'm causing the compression on that side. But if I decide to lay on the left side, I'm causing kind of adduction movement on the right side. Okay. And that's why laying on the side is a problem unless you do the modification Dr. Rahman was discussing. Okay, you can do like a supine lying position with hips a little bit abducted, or you can do a side lying position on, on, the, on the unaffected side and have like a pillow so that your leg is not, not going into that reduction. Okay, so the idea is to keep it in like a, keep it in a position where you're not called stretching the TFL. Yeah, or stretching the ITB in general. So those are the sensitive areas, pain generators. Yeah. So this is a good treatment demonstration. I mean, you can do MET. Actually, Dr. Rahman, you can talk about this. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. So mm -hmm. the dysfunction I, I can diagnose is a inertial sacral flexion because um, sacral base is deep on this, that side. And we find some uh, leg length discrepancy, and all the tests are positive. So, where to start? This is the most important thing. Like, should I start from the hip or from the SI joint? So, for me, I personally like to start from the SI joint because if you do not uh, uh, kind of treat the root cause, it's not going to help you much, you know? And so, I'm going to start with the manipulation, sacral manipulation, sideline, grade five. I'm going to do uh, muscle energy techniques to correct the uh, leg length discrepancy, like right posterior mid rotation. Then I'm going to also uh, advise patient to start some isometrics, hip abduction. Or you can remember like laying, uh, going supine with the band around, around, your, around your thigh, pillow under your both knees, uh, 30 second hold, five repetitions, if, if they can tolerate that that much, twice a day. Then after that, if they can tolerate, you can start gluteal, uh, progression like double leg bridge, then offset, then single leg. Then once the patient is ready to uh, take the load, we can start doing exercise in functional position. Like it's going to start with the uh, offset squat, single leg stance, single leg squat, and step up. And to uh, treat those uh, inhibited muscle or um, tight muscle, we can start grinding if the patient uh, is okay with that. And Dr. Singh also mentioned that to, to, to correct the inhibited muscle, we can also manipulate the lower number spine, number four, number five. Um, and also most important thing is, uh, beside all these, patients should be correct, correcting their sitting, their laying position with adequate adequate pillows. And I'm gonna also give you home ex home, the home exercise program, uh, how to do the self asymmetrics, you know, and also probably I'm gonna give him or her the printed copy of the exercise program, what to do, what not to do. So that could be, I think, um, a comprehensive treatment that address the, all this regional interdependence, all the areas that can be the causing the, the problem, the root causes, you know. I think that's uh, conclude our lecture. So next I'll uh, request Dr. Singh or Dr. Steve to um, kind of next few slides, they can leave it explain a little bit more. Thank you very so, much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahman. This is like probably one of the most brilliant le lectures we've taught in like an hour. Thank you very much. Over, but I mean, this was like amazing lecture. I mean, uh, the amount of information I think we gave out was, was ex uh, this was extraordinary lecture because the amount of info, if you s apply this information on your lateral hip patients, I mean, you're going to be helping them immensely. Yeah. If you can use, if you can, we will add, we will share this on the on YouTube so that you can have relook at it, relook at some of the slides. But the amount of information given out was like absolutely excellent, and most of the research is like published in the last ten years. So this was an excellent lecture. Thank Coming you. back to cohort two, we are starting cohort two uh, in a week, and our next first lecture is 
foundations lecture, which we are teaching on Saturday and Sunday next weekend. We still have some spots available if you want to join and be a part of this journey. This is probably one of the best lectures I've attended. And I think I learned a lot of finer details here. So that, thank you, Dr. Rahman. <laughs> no, actually, but, our, our, my, my base actually was kind of all came from you and Dr. Steve, you know. So I'm really okay. grateful to you both. <laughs> this will be on thank YouTube. You. So you can have a you can you can subscribe to Gem Physio on YouTube and you can find this. Yeah, and I mean, we are passionate about what we do and we like to follow the literature and research. And I think Dr. Rahman did an excellent job in just putting that information together because uh, do you mind displaying? I think this will be on YouTube so you can have like, this will be available to you. You can, we can, I think these are the 12 modules we teach and uh, we start with foundations and biomechanics next weekend and we go one one weekend a month we talk about different topics and then physically we are traveling to delhi and bombay twice a year so that we can have like hands on lectures with you guys so we spend like time yes if you pass the quiz you get a certificate i mean i think we'll i think dr dhumi will share the quiz dr rahman has create, created these 10 question quiz for you guys and uh, We'll also we're also adding two electives. We you can attend the online lectures or online le offline lectures. This I think reach out to Dr. Dhumi for details. We are running a little bit of a special on our online modules, but I mean we have an online module where you can become a certified expert orthopedic manual therapist. Offline module you can become a diplomat. But you do have to attend two weeks of hands-on, which we're conducting in Delhi and Bombay at this point, and we plan to expand it to other cities. I think, is there any relation between FAI with GTPS? It can, if you have FAI, you can have GTPS, but those are two, yes, absolutely, they can affect each other, but they are kind of a different diagnosis. They usually happen at a different I think I would say different decades of life, but it's a possibility. Intraarticular problems can cause extraarticular problems, and extraarticular problems can cause intraarticular problems in certain situations. Yeah. Okay. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. You can email us, email us at admin at the I think Dr. Pooja did a lecture on AG. FAI and she did an excellent job explaining how AGMR can cause FAI. So yes, is the answer. And that I think that lecture will be available on YouTube as well. We try to bring in these lectures because I think the profession we are in, it is changing at a very fast rate. Some of the stuff we, I think I graduated 15 years ago and some of the stuff we practice is very different from the way we learned. <laughs> and Dr. Hassan might agree with me on this. <laughs> I mean, our, our practice patterns are changing at a rapid rate and we need, just need to keep up with it because, I mean, we can learn more and be better at what we do. Any final words, Dr. Heman, from you? This was a brilliant lecture. I think people enjoyed it. Thank you very much. You know, thank you for for like uh, for your time and all the participants, especially the Sunday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Rahman. I think we will share this lecture on YouTube. So if you want to go back and relook at it, I mean, I do think that you'll probably, this is a lot of information. So you may have to go and relook at the lecture. I think this is a, this is amazing information. Okay. And uh, people who are in cohort one, uh, we will, cohort two, we will see you next weekend. Okay. And I think uh, we'll share the times and details of the course. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Dr. Heman, for putting us this putting this oh, excellent lecture like, together uh, with this amazing information. I really the, uh, quiz, quiz already shared in the in the uh, WhatsApp. Have right you shared the quiz, Dr. Dhrumi? I think she Dr. Dhrumi will share the quiz. Yeah, I think she just shared the quiz. Uh in the in the WhatsApp group. So please attend the quiz if you are looking to get your certificate. Yeah. And I think she shared the quiz. Thank you again, Dr. Iman, for your time. I appreciate all, the, all the participants for attending. You have to score more than 7 on 10 to get your certificate. Thank
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Rahman, again. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye.